this is more important. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Are we ready? Are we ready? Yeah. All right. Michael is our next speaker. Let's welcome him. I'm just going to get started. So I'm going to present work on the Look Ahead Optimizer. This is joint work with my great collaborators, James Lucas, Jeff Hinton, and Jimmy Bach. So uh, I guess just quick check, how familiar are we with optimization? Like who has heard of Atom before? <laughs> OK, cool. So yeah, we'll just go through some related work. Um, so a lot of work on optimization has been on like adapting momentum or uh, like changing how fast you train on different directions. But another perspective you can take is on like averaging the weights you accumulate throughout training. So this has actually been studied in from the perspective of convex optimization back in 1992 by Polyak and Rupert had some work in 1988 as well. So essentially what the work from before showed is that if you take the arithmetic average of your weights, uh, you get faster convergence in convex optimization. Technical issue? Yeah. Okay, is it okay if you only see the slides over there? Sure, yeah, that's fine. Let me see. Yeah. Oh, so uh, it's not yours. Uh, that's right. Yep, that's, that's right. right. All right. Could you just recap quickly? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So while weight averaging has been studied in convex optimization, people haven't really looked at it more carefully in neural networks until more recently. And uh, one example of this is stochastic weight averaging, which comes from a group in 20, from CMU in 2018. So the idea of this is uh, you also just train a neural network randomly, but you can sort of create an ensemble effect by averaging the weights you obtain at different points in training. You average those weights in weight space, and then using that model, you can uh, get lower test error and uh, just do better generally. So this shows that even in like deep neural network space, averaging weights tends to get you to a region of like lower loss surface, uh, of lower like test error. And we'll sort of see this sort of visualization come up in our work as well. And one other work that we'll, I'll briefly mention is you, uh, people have looked at trying to find like what's like the sort of best weight average weights by trying to find a position where the gradient is zero because that corresponds to either a minima or a SATA point. And you can do this by solving a system of linear equations based on your past iterates. However, this takes more memory, which is like k, the number of iterates you consider, and like by the length of the, your neural network, which could be millions of parameters. So uh, I'll just dive into our method, which sort of relates to the previous work that's been done. So. Uh, Going back to like a Hinton paper from the 90s, we'll refer to our weights as the fast weights and the slow weights. So we have some initial point here, uh, which we cache. And then we take steps using an inner optimizer, such as stochastic gradient descent or atom. And this might take us uh, to a few different uh, positions and parameter space. So after we take a set number of steps, for example, five steps, what we do is uh, we look at the point we started at, the slow weight that we cached, and then we take a step in this higher order direction generated by taking multiple steps of the inner optimizer. So in this case, this is this particular direction, and we, instead of going all the way to where we uh, have stepped, we go like something like 0.5 or 0.8 of the weight instead. Uh, so we get to this position here. And then from this position, we again cache the point, take more steps of the inner optimizer, such as Adam, 
uh, we end up at a new point, and then this is our new search direction. So our next update is in list direction, and then we repeat the process from the orange point again. Uh, you can write lists out in pseudocode as well, where the thetas correspond to uh, like the fast weights and the slow weights, and this sort of just falls into the paradigm of nested loop optimization that has seen resurgence lately. Right, so that's the method. Um, oh, we'll go on into another way to visualize this method. So this sort of gives a bit of intuition on why uh, look ahead tends to work well, which we'll see occurs in a wide variety of domains. So again, we, t we start from our starting point here, and we take k steps. This is using stochastic gradient descent. And uh, what you'll notice is that if you interpolate along this direction between the first and last iterates, you get to a region of higher test accuracy. And you also actually turn out to have lower training loss and uh, lo higher train accuracy as well. So all the metrics you care about, you tend to do better by doing this sort of interpolation. And we can show that you can continue along the trajectory of SGD. Uh, you'll still end up on the outside, whereas if you do another look ahead step, you end up at a region of even higher accuracy. Uh, the way we generated this plot is you take three points on the in parameter space, which might be like five million parameters, and what we do is we define a plane using these three points. So you can define a plane by subtracting these two points and then projecting everything onto that first dimension. And then uh, the second component is subtract this point from this point in this high dimensional space, subtract the components that's explained by the first one, and then you have like a 2D way to visualize your weights in high dimension. So this might lead to some artifacts because of the projection, but in general you can see that like along this direction we tend to get to a region of higher test accuracy. Um, so to explain like more mathematically why this works, we can look at the noisy quadratic analysis. Uh, this has been a model used sort of as a easier way to explain phenomena that occur in deep neural network optimization, since it's typically hard to analyze that directly. So there's work, a lot of good work from like James Martins, Roger Gross, Tony Wu, and uh, Guodong on the noisy quadratic model. And essentially the way this model works is we assume a quadratic model of the loss where theta is our parameters. And instead of getting the true gradient, which would be AI theta I here, we get a noisy version along each dimension. So we get AI theta I plus CI, uh, where CI is drawn from a normal Gaussian distribution. So this sort of mod uh, models like the stochasticity from like uh, training your model, and uh, it does a good job of explaining effects of batch size, which like recent work from Guodong has shown that the effects of batch size are well explained by this model. So this is a model we use for our analytical analysis. Uh, so using this model, what you can do is uh, you can compute the variance of look ahead and vanilla gradient descent after uh, like some number of updates. And what you find is that the fixed point variance of look ahead is always lower than that of SGD because this first term here is less than one. Uh, you can plot this on the noisy quadratic model as well, and you see that even with different choices of alpha, we tend to converge to a region of lower loss. So on the simple quadratic model, it checks out. Uh, we'll turn now to empirical results on a variety of different domains. So the first setting is CFAR 10, uh, where we, so to explain these experiments, what we do is we optimize for the inner loop optimizer, such as stochastic gradient descent here. We find the best high profounders for stochastic gradient descent, and then uh, we, use those settings and then tune the choices of K and alpha for look ahead. So uh, just a quick reminder, I guess, uh, K and alpha correspond to how many steps we take with the inner loop optimizer, and alpha is the amount we step in the direction. So these are the two additional hyperparameters we introduce. So if you do this procedure, you can see on CFAR 10, look ahead uh, performs best in terms of reducing the trading loss. And we can actually show a variety of different things, such as robustness to hyperparameters. So in the case where you change the inner loop optimizer, such as SGD and 
like you say you picked a bad learning rate, uh, you can see that even with a variety of different learning rates, Lookhead still performs much better. So across a broader range of hyperparameter settings, you still can recover better performance than just using SGD itself. Uh, we can do this with momentum as well, so you observe a similar effect. And uh, one other thing is, one complaint you might have is we're introducing K and alpha, which are two additional hyperparameters that you have to tune. But uh, as this experiment shows, if you try different choices of K and alpha, you still get better performance than the SGD baseline, which is shown in blue. Uh, you can see that the other choices of look-ahead parameters do better than the SGD. Yeah. Uh, and one other intuition to mention here is that what we can actually do is we can plot the accuracy or the loss of each point along the slow weight, fast weight trajectory. So when we do this, we see that the fast weights tend to degrade the test accuracy, and then when you do the interpolation step, you get restored to a region of higher test accuracy. And this effect is even more drastic right after a learning rate decay. Here you can see that generally the fast weight, uh, the slow weights just restore the previous performance. And this matches with the intuition from the noisy quadratic model earlier, where we showed that look ahead reduces the variance and hence is more likely to be at a point of better accuracy. We can also do this with, uh, by scaling it to ImageNet, which is a huge uh, image classification data set with over a million training images. And we train a model that has 25 million parameters. You can see that look ahead converges faster. We picked a learning rate schedule. So the one that goes here with the dotted dashed line, that's like the traditional one used by most people in computer vision. But we found that like look ahead performance like plateaus much earlier. So this suggests that you can even decay your learning rate faster. So you get this waterfall effect earlier and you get to a region of higher accuracy faster than you would before. So I guess one thing here is that we use the learning rate schedules that people have used for like SGD or Atom, and we don't like specifically tune them for our optimizer. That's like a potential direction for future work. It was also scales to ResNet 152 as well with like little tuning. You just change it. You just change ResNet 50 to 152 and you still get the faster convergence effect. And uh, we can see that not only do you get faster convergence, but typically generalization tends to improve a bit as well. So uh, like look ahead generalizes pretty well on both image data sets. On neural machine translation with uh, the transformer models, we actually also see slightly faster convergence. The final performance is more or less the same. But here this highlights that you can also use Atom as an inner loop optimizer and you still get really good performance. And finally on Pen Tree Bank, here we wrap look ahead around both SGD and Atom. And you can see that uh, we actually dominate the perplexity curve with the solid line and get almost uh, like versus the baseline, we get higher test perplexity by almost two perplexity points, which is pretty significant. That's a language model. Yeah, this is a language model and task. So to summarize, uh, this is a new algorithm that gives you better convergence on a variety of different tasks with little hyperparameter tuning. So in the context of having a new data set which you're unsure about, this could be a good thing to try because you can just throw it in there and it, you don't need to tune hyperparameter so much and you can get faster convergence. Uh, this is due to the reduced variance effect we explained earlier. And I guess in terms of extensions, we can sort of look at into learning rate scheduling and a whole family of methods that maintain memory information. So here we maintain one additional copy of the parameters you can sort of imagine different ways of updating that copy. And finally, if you want to use look ahead, um, it's two lines to incorporate into your existing code. You have an existing optimizer, and then you just need to add an if condition where you set your alpha and steps, and we have code online as well. So yeah, this paper will be at NURPS 2019 in a few months. I'm happy to take questions. Beautiful. Let's thank uh, Michael quickly. Do you uh, so you update in the internal loop? You update as if regular SGD, right? Yeah. After 
you pass a few number of steps, then you determine the direction that you want to operate. Is that yeah, right? exactly. The inner loop, uh, you just use exactly SGD. Like you, we don't do any. We just use SGD in the loop. Uh, have you encountered any problem, or did you try to specify different activation function when you try this, uh, yeah. this method? Yeah. Uh, we we mainly use like the value activation, I guess, because mm -hmm. for these benchmarks, there's typically like an architecture and like training procedure people follow, and we just keep that fixed, and then like change the optimizer. So, so there is no need to shift from to, to a different activation function, like nothing. No, yeah, we don't need to change anything else. Um, so you attribute most of the performance improvement to variance reduction. Mm -hmm. um, if we did uh, full batch reading descent instead of stochastic, do you uh, expect the results to still hold? Yeah, I think that's a tricky question because there's like a lot of papers arguing about large batch versus small batch, so it's hard to say. Like, there's poss it's possible that stochasticity is important in getting you into a place that generalizes well as well. So, like, I think our results like hold for the SGD settings, so but it's hard to extrapolate to full batch. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so very quickly, with the last question, um, is, is your is the intuition behind this is that you kind of uh, uh, reduce the variance in between batches, um, and, and in some way, I think empirically also showed that it's similar to momentum in, in, in some ways. Is that what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's generally true. Like you might think that you're reducing overfitting to each specific mini batch, like in the plot I showed where accuracy can degrade quite significantly because you're incorporating like more information before you actually take an update. Let's thank Michael. Thank you very much.